Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to IDG Live. Today we are looking at House Umber, one of the most important houses in all of the North, but I think one that sometimes gets a little bit ignored because there are some slightly smaller houses like House Reed, for example, um, that we were looking at last week that are very intriguing. But in the history of the North, House Umber has got a massive role. And indeed, in the story of A Song of Ice and Fire, House Umber have got a massive role. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. As always, I'm going to be uh, starting with a bit of an overview, but then I will try and pick up as many questions as we can, both from the chat and from my patrons. So let's get straight into this. And uh, as always, I'll try and bring up this uh, helpful little map. So this is from quartermaster.info. Um, highly recommend you go over there and check that out. A really good interactive map of Westeros. Now, what we're looking at here is the north. And House Umber are one of the oldest uh, houses that we know of. Um, they their exact beginnings are lost in the midst, uh, mists of time, but they are uh, first men, and they have been in the North for a very long time. So long, in fact, that they were one of the uh, the original, when there were many, many kingdoms in the North, theirs was one of those kingdoms. Eventually, they were forced to bend the knee to the Starks. Um, we often talk about the, or think about the Starks as ruling over all of the North, for long periods of time, um, which they have, but for many thousands of years, the Starks were just one of many kings in the north. And one by one, they took on and defeated uh, the other kingdoms around them. And one of those kingdoms was this kingdom of House Umber. Now, in the map here, we can see where they are. So if you if you take a look, Right at the top of the map there, you'll see the wall. Um, if you if you sort of go down from that, um, the road that heads sort of down straight from the middle from Castle Black there, that is the King's Road. That uh, sort of bisects, dissects the, the north. Just to the east, the right of that, just a little way down near the forest there, you will see the last hearth. That is the home of House Umber. Now their lands um, extend all the way from the hills below them there. Those are the lonely hills. We get the last river as well, which is theirs. Um, their lands extend all the way from there up to the bottom of the new gift. We'll talk about that in just one moment. Um, and then across to the Bay of Seals, so all the way over to the sea, and all the way over to the King's Road um, uh, to the west. But they do also, uh, sort of west of the King's Road, then they sometimes uh, keep their sheep out there as well, so it's a little bit more flexible. But it's quite a large swathe of land here. And Probably the most important thing to, to be noting about the positioning here is that they are the most northerly of the mainland Westerosi houses, uh, the significant ones. There's a few of the sort of the mountain clans over there to the, the west that are perhaps slightly closer uh, to the wall, but in terms of the big houses that we know, House Umber are the most northerly. And that is shows because whereas some of the houses when you get further to the south of the north particularly when we're thinking about the Mandalays, but also the Dustins the Ricewells they have been more impacted by uh, the Andals by uh, access to the rest of Westeros. House Umber is off on its own closest to the wall they are the first um house, the first main castle that any incursion from the north would reach. Now, when you go through their history, you will find that this happens again and again. They are the, the house that has to react first when there is a wildling incursion. There's the legend of Gendel and Gorn. I think it's said to be 3,000 years before uh, the time of the Song of Ice and Fire. Gendel and Gorn were some wildlings and brothers who were called in to adjudicate in this um, 
sort of quarrel between the children of the forest and the um, the giants about um, ownership, basically, of some caves which go under the wall. Gendel and Gorn said, solution here is nobody gets them. You all leave them alone. And they then took them over themselves, cheating everybody. They led a wildling incursion. It's House Umber and House Stark who pushed them back. So uh, this is what House Umber deals with. And over time, what you found is that the area to the north of their lands, the gift, this, although it used to have lots of um, smaller holdfasts and farms and things like that, as the the, the strength of the wall in the Night's Watch has diminished and decreased, uh, that has become less and less populated, and the Umbers are more and more on the front line against the um, uh, the wildling incursions. So that's where they are. If you imagine Northerners, they are archetypal Northerners. They are all tall, broad, strong, um, very hairy. Um, they stick to a lot of the old ways. Um, there are rumours that they stick to some of the um, things like the right of the, the Lord's right to the first knight, which was banned across the Seven Kingdoms. But this is a very out of the way place. Nobody really goes there unless you're going there. So rumours persist that they carry on. Um, with that, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of skip to one intriguing moment during the Targaryen uh, reign, um, which does bring them to the fore a little bit, which is when Queen Alison, we talk, we've talked about this in a couple of different angles, Queen Alison um, Targaryen, this is as in Jaehaerys and Alison, she heads up to the north. Jaehaerys is He's been detained down in King's Landing. They're supposed to be doing a progress around the north. Um, she's just doing it herself. One of the places that she goes is the last hearth with her dragon. She lands there um, and she spends some time at the last hearth, as well as going on to places like Queen's Crown and then up to the wall. But when she's up there, uh, she decides that the Night's Watch need more support. They need um, uh, they need more money. They need more resources. Uh, she personally pays. She sells off uh, some of her own jewelry. She personally pays for them to be to get a new castle built on the wall, and then also she lobbies Jaehaerys, and Jaehaerys basically tells the Starks this is what's going to happen. They need more land to support them, because they had the gift, uh, Brandon's gift, which is the top bit of land which was supporting the wall. But it was decided they needed another band of land below that. That's what's called the new gift. So you will, so the, uh, the gift is split into two sections, one which is thousands of years old, and another further to the south, that was given uh, during the time of the Targaryens. Now, when we normally tell this story, this is told from the perspective of Alison and the Night's Watch and how this did help the Night's Watch in the short term, certainly. Um, but the other side of this is that this land had to come from someone. And most of this land came from House Umber. And the Starks were not happy about this. They they basically were told that they had to tell House Umber that they got to give up some land. Uh, the Umbers were obviously not happy about it, but they just had to swallow it. So the lands belonging to House Umber were even larger before Alison Targaryen gave away some of their land to the Night's Watch. Um, another incident that perhaps says a lot about how House Umber relates to the wider world is there was once a tourney. During the Targaryen times, there was a tourney at the last hearth. This is quite rare in the north. Yes, the very south areas of the north, places like um, uh, 
White Harbour, places like Barrington, then yeah, sometimes you might get a tourney or two here and there, but not further north. But they did hold one at um, the last hearth once. And we're told that I think it was 18 people died and many more were wounded simply because there are tourney rules, which basically means, yes, sometimes people die in tourneys, but not lots of people. The, the umbers just do not grasp this idea of tourney rules. And so when there was a tourney in their place, people died. So moving forward to the, the story that we have and uh, the character is he's, he's right behind me there uh, the character that we most associate with uh, house umber is great john umber great john umber is a fantastic character larger than life he is hugely tall he is we're, we're told as tall as hodor hodor is described as being seven feet tall or perhaps even a bit taller than that um, and twice as broad as hodor great john umber is a massive human being and um he's got a huge beard he's got a booming voice um everywhere he goes he is just full of energy his son the heir is called small john uh, umber and this is sort of an in joke because he's not small he's about the same size as his father as it happens and this is true this size thing is true for pretty much all of the umbers the umbers are just huge they're they're all over six foot some of them up to seven foot or even taller than that um we'll get on to why that might be a little bit later but this is what they physically are like they are imposing um and the kind of people you want on your side great john great john umber answers the call to arms when rob calls the banners he answers he like the other uh, noble lords the heads of the main houses he when he gets to winterfell sort of challenges rob's authority the rest perhaps slightly more subtly he um literally in in rob stark's own hall pulls a sword on him and rob uh or rather gray wind uh, rob's direwolf jumps on great john bites off a couple of his fingers at which point rob skillfully it has to be said diffuses the situation by saying uh, Surely the only reason why you should be drawing your sword, uh, drawing a blade in my hall, is if you wish to cut your cut my meat for me. And then Great John Umber has been given a way out because he knows that if he drew, drew a sword in the presence of his liege lord, then probably he should he should be sac uh, he should be killed for that. But he accepts this effective hand of friendship and he says your your meat is tough at which point from then on he becomes rob stark or one of rob stark's strongest allies he is proclaiming that this this man here this is who he's following again i think this is showing a little bit of the character of uh, the umbers because rob had to prove himself there was nothing here like with the Mandalays just happily came along because, oh, this is the, the next. Uh, Ned was still alive at this point, but Rob was the heir. And as heir was just basically calling the banners and saying, let's go to war. The Mandalays happily just came along because this was the Stark uh, Lord telling them what to do. The Umbers a lot more like the wildlings. Remember, they're, they're that close to the wall. They're a lot more like the wildlings. The wildlings don't just follow somebody who is a king. They follow a person who has earned the respect um, and earned the right to lead. So that's, again, a microcosm of House Umber. Great John with the uh, small John um, head south with um 
Rob Stark and his army, and he comes with Rob over uh, with his sort of faster, lighter uh, group of soldiers over onto the west of the river, taking out River Run. And then from um, when they're there, after Ned, they've heard the news, Ned dies, the person who first calls for Rob to be named king is Great John Umber. He's the person who rallies people. He is there, they're debating what to do because the situation has changed. Ned is now dead. Um, we've got Joffrey Baratheon as king. We've got two um, other Baratheons, Renly and Stannis, both claiming to be king. What are they going to do? And basically, Great John Umber just stands up. And remember, he's just, he's a huge human being. He stands up and he bellows out, we're told. He bellows out that uh, he's never going to kneel to a Lannister. And he doesn't know who these other guys are. Renly, Stannis, not going to kneel to them. He said, you know, we, we married the dragons. You know, we, we had to submit to the dragons, but the dragons are gone. So there's now only one person that I'm going to proclaim as king. Rob Stark, king in the north. He is the person who starts, and, and, and he kneels, he lays his sword down before Rob. But for him and that um, intervention, maybe Rob wouldn't have become king at all. It certainly doesn't seem to have been in Rob's mind, as far as we're aware, um, that he should declare himself king. But Great John as showed his own leadership qualities there, following on, Rickard Carstark followed him, uh, shouting out, King in the North. Then Mage Mormont also followed. Uh, she, incidentally, I, I don't think I mentioned this when we were talking about the uh, House Mormont a couple of weeks ago. She shouts out, the King of Winter, uh, which is the ancient title. So uh, if you... I mean, looking back at this map, um, if you uh, think about Bear Island, that's the island there off to the west. That's the other most northerly house that we have. It's, it's off of the mainland, uh, so it's on its own island, but it's the other most northerly house. So House Umber are the ones to proclaim the Starks kings, and House Mormont are the ones to try and give them their old title back. Anyway, Great John... Uh, heads off with Rob into the Westerlands and, and does quite a few pretty heroic things. Uh, we discover he heads off, he captures several gold mines, we're told. Um, and uh, eventually, when they uh, head back, he is there, um, uh, they, they get back to River Run after the situation changes again, um, they get back to River Run and decide... Okay, we're headed, we, we're going to go up to what will become the Red Wedding and then recapturing the North. He is one of the lords who witnesses Rob Stark's will. He then heads to the Red, what will become the Red Wedding. And it's noticeable, again, you can see these kind of how people view Great John Umber um, by what special arrangements they're that they're willing to make. Uh, they didn't have, as far as we can tell, the Boltons and the Freys didn't have particular plans for any other individuals, but they did have a particular plan for Great John Umber because they thought, okay, he is going to be, he has, he, we can't say he's not going to be in the, the wedding itself. Um, he will be in that room and he's going to be incredibly dangerous. So what are we going to do? And so they they allocated Merritt Frey, who um, it's, it's his POV. We discover this from his POV is the epilogue to um, Storm of Swords. Um, and we discover that he, and he's got quite a tragic story. We'll talk about him another time. But he's got quite a tragic story, but he's, he's an alcoholic, as far as we can tell in our modern uh, way of uh, talking about these things. And he is given the job of getting Great John Umber drunk. 
the thinking being if he's drunk uh maybe we can make him pass out maybe we can just make him less coordinated so when the fighting starts he can be out of the action a bit um they had to have a special plan for him merit frey who could out drink anybody in the twins um passed out in the attempt to get the great john drunk um when the betrayal happened great john umber uh, just went crazy as far as we can tell he had it, it took eight people to take him down eight people on one human holding him down one of those he killed several more of those he managed to injure but they did finally manage to uh, uh, capture him um small john umber uh, leapt to Rob Stark's personal defence, throwing a, a table over him to protect him from um, the crossbow bolts that were coming down from above. Um, Small John gets killed. The Great John gets captured and is, as we speak, um, still a prisoner of the phrase at the twins so that's the great john umber story now that's the bit of the story that most of us know but back up at the last half there's more going on so they uh, when the great john left um we don't know who's next in line after small john we're told that great john umber had several children so the implication is that an as yet unnamed other child of his is the heir however he left two castellans his uncles his uncles hothor and moors umber who are really intriguing characters so he left them in charge now hothor was known as Horsbane um because he killed a whore um, a sex worker in really quite a gruesome way, it has to be said. Uh, Moors uh, was known as Crow Food uh, because one time he fell asleep by the side of the road. Um, a crow thought he was dead and started trying to pick out his eye. Um, he kills the crow, but his eye was lost. Uh, and so he now has an eye patch, or sometimes he puts a bit of dragon glass in there. And they're both these old but really strong characters and um the two of them we see briefly in the uh, clash of kings they come over there's a, a harvest feast in winterfell and they talk to bran about um the fact that the wildlings are starting to um come down um and they, they want a fleet uh, so clearly what we know as of the the main wildling army uh mance raiders army is sort of heading down across land some wildlings are getting in boats and just heading down the east coast of westeros just trying to escape the others uh it's just a hint of what's going on um they get told you build these with house mandley when we're talking about house mandley um we saw it from their perspective and from their perspective they're building a northern fleet upriver with the trees from the forest uh, that um, is uh, that surrounds the last last hearth. So that's what the fleet was originally built for to protect the east coast of the north against these wildling attacks. But it may well have other purposes coming up as well. So they head back, um, but then news comes of the Red Wedding. And House Umber are in a, an awkward situation because their lord is held prisoner. They, they absolutely hate the phrase and the Boltons for what has just happened. Uh, their heir, Small John, has been killed. All of, all of their army who went down south has been massacred. And their lord is being held captive they have to go and bend the knee to roose bolton at which point we don't see any discussions we don't know what happened but they split in two uh, the two castellans uh hothor and moors and 
uh, one of them, Hothor, does what House Umber is supposed to do. He goes with, um, we tell told, grey beards with the old men. Most, most of the fighting age men had already gone south with Rob. But he goes with a group of the older men um, to the Boltons. And uh, they arrive, they pay homage, they do everything they should. Roos Bolton says, though, he doesn't really trust them. Uh, which is probably fair, because the other uncle, Moore's um, crow food, he declares for Stannis, effectively. And whereas Hothor stays in Winterfell when the snows start um, to fall, um, Moore's stays just outside Winterfell and starts to engage in what can probably only be called guerrilla warfare. He is just outside Winterfell, so he, when Theon escapes with what people assume is Arya, he's the one who finds them and takes them to Stannis. But also, he has this um, uh, sort of cunning, devious plan. He gets his... He's He's got the the young boys, so that the, the old people went with Hothor, and Moors has the, the young boys. Um, he has them digging holes just outside the gates of Winterfell. So when the snow comes, the snow covers over these holes. Um, he then gets people blowing horns just outside Winterfell gates, so that the phrase come rushing out. Um, and they can't see that there's massive holes there. They ride over the holes, fall into them. They lose, you know, some some of the phrase die. Others, um, they lose their horses. A small but um, important victory there um, for the anti-Bolton forces. And that's broadly where we leave it. Um, there's clearly something going on between those two. We will unpick that um, uh, later on in this live stream. There's clearly something going <coughs> going on there. Roose Bolton doesn't trust them. Roose Bolton probably is right not to trust uh, the Umbers who are inside the walls. The Umbers outside the walls um, are basically declaring for Stannis, not because they're particularly for Stannis, but because they hate the Boltons and the Freys. Great John is still um, at um, the Twins, although Jamie has sent a message to Walder Frey saying all of your prisoners need to be out of the twins but they're not staying there anymore these are these are not fray prisoners these are going to be lannister prisoners so at some point we might expect to see maybe this has already started we don't know we might expect to see great john umber heading south through the riverlands heading to king's landing so that's where the different moving uh moving pieces are uh let's go have a quick um Look in the uh, the chat. Uh, few uh, questions, uh, Mara Lee. Just before we went on air, um, hi there, Mara. Um, good to see you. Said just a show of love and appreciation for the great content, merch, and stories. You and Dan, your handsome dog, are the best and very loved. Thank you very much. Um, you know how much I appreciate your support, Mara. Um, uh, let's flick through there. I had another couple of questions in the chat if I can find them. Uh, Martin S. Um, saying, good evening, Robert. Do you think the family name Umber is inspired by the southern Middle-earth city uh, with the name Umbar? Um, I mean, I think probably not. George, George R. R. Martin does take a lot of uh, inspiration from uh, Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. Uh, for northern houses, though, my my best guess is there is, um, in the north of England, there is a big river called the River Humber, um, and then the area around that is Humberside. Um, so 
my best guess is that was the inspiration for him. He he does, for example, another town, is Bolton. Um, uh, so he does definitely look at the map of Northern England um, for inspiration when it comes to uh, what to be um, naming some of these northern houses. Um, and we also had a question. Um, oh, yeah, Catherine Firth, Firth saying we never get to see if Ned had a similar moment uh, when young, when he showed his worthiness as Lord that Rob had there. No, that's absolutely true. So we don't we don't see that. I, I think we we have to assume that that's the case. So the the earning the respect of House Umber was very important for Rob. Um, uh, and one can only assume that Ned must have had to do that uh, in his own time. Um, John Greenwood with your first super chat. Uh, thank you. Uh, saying, you're the best, Robert. Well, thank you again. Uh, what is the Umber's military strength heading into winds? Do you think they will be a significant part of a stark resurgence? resurgence? Um, military strength... Um, I mean, it's not great now. Basically, as far as we can tell, they they put most of their army, um, the you know, all of the the sort of proper uh, fighting age men went south with Rob Stark. They died either out in battle or at uh, the Red Wedding. So they've all gone. Now, we can assume that they've probably still got a garrison left at the last half, um, but the the two armies, as it were, um, that's probably overstating what, what they are, uh, the two armies are of opposing ages, that those within, those with Hothor, with Horsbane inside uh, Winterfell, those are old men. And those with moors outside Winterfell, those are young men. Now, uh, if you were to sort of pick which do you go with, then I suppose you would say, well, the younger men can only get stronger and more experienced, whereas the older men, um, we know what they're like in the north in the winter. They're not expecting to, probably not expecting to return home. So in terms of fighting, uh, and their military strength is not great, it has to be said. Um, there are plenty of others who have more, like the Mandalays have got quite uh, quite a good amount of strength left. Uh, but no, I, they, they, I don't think we can see them as a significant fighting force. It's their, their knowledge of combat in the north, which is winning for them at the moment. Um, uh, Andrew Kay saying surely Northumberland uh, is part of the inspiration as well, works on numerous levels. Yeah, so Northumberland, sorry, I should also have said that. Uh, good point. Northumberland, if we're talking about the geography of the north, is uh, that and Northumbria, uh, that part of um, England that's right at the very north. Uh, so uh, it's uh, Hadrian's Wall sort of actually goes through it um so yeah um northumberland as well as uh, the river umber uh umber humber um i i think that's where the inspiration for the name probably came from um okay let's go to um a morally a question. Why do you think House Umber's coat of arms is a roaring giant? Is it because it describes the size of the uh, the men of the house um, or something more? And Dr. D. Bunk also building on this, saying perhaps it's a trickle of giant's blood. Umbers are known to be some of the biggest men in Westeros. Building off the fact that the sigil on the coat of arms is a giant breaking his chains. The Umbers use a defiant giant to represent themselves. Could they be partially descended from a captive giant who broke free from his chains and lived among men in the ancient past? Well, yeah, this is the working assumption. The um, the Umbers are very tall, um, and there are a lot of tall characters in this world. 
but it's noticeable, as I said, that the only character that we know who is clearly taller than the Great John, for example, and Small John, is the mountain who is freakish. He's eight foot tall. Um, and all of the Umbers seem to be not just tall, but broad as well. Um, and with big beards and this idea that perhaps there might be some giant blood mixed in there from a long, long time ago. They're the closest to the wall. This is where the giants were. We know that there's at least one legend where giants um, uh, were involved as well as House Umber. So it's possible. Um, the the imagery so the sigil is this giant breaking free from chains that's what the imagery is now if it was just a giant that makes sense but the breaking free from chains really is quite an in interesting addition to this because it does seem to imply someone who was a prisoner who is breaking free now some people have suggested that perhaps as well as being maybe backward looking to yeah maybe they maybe they did capture a giant once and then that giant um lived among them uh but maybe as well as backward looking it's forward looking because great john himself is a bit of a giant and he currently is in chains is he going to escape somehow is he going to break free from his bonds there's uh, I've got questions about this in more detail later, so I won't go too much detail, but I think that the the sigil here is interesting because we know that he is going to be heading or should be heading south through the Riverlands and the amount of sympathetic groups that are there in the Riverlands is huge. We have Lady Stoneheart with the Brotherhood Without Banners. Um, we have the super pack of wolves, I is uh, Nymeria's super pack of wolves. We've got um, the blackfish. We've got the garrison from uh, Riverrun. Um, we've got um, Brienne. There's there's so many people who could potentially uh, be there rescuing um, him or causing a distraction while he rescues himself. It's it's an intriguing possibility, uh, and although I suspect this wasn't part of the original plan, George R. R. Martin will have created that thinking. You know, the, the the sigil the sigil was described all the way back in book one. Um, it, probably he hadn't thought of Great John Umber breaking free from his chains at that point. Maybe he had. Who knows? Um, but. Uh, he definitely was thinking about it in a backwards sense. So giants, they are giants, and uh, they figuratively and perhaps literally have a little bit of giant blood in them. Um, okay, let's go... Oh, Catherine Firstseth saying giant blood is said about Hodor as well. Yes, it is, although uh, with... Um, with Hodor, the implication is that perhaps this was Sir Duncan the Tall was his ancestor. Um, that's an entire different rabbit hole to go down, but the, that's the the suggestion because the, there's another. Um, well, uh, th there's there's two other characters who potentially are also Dunk's descendants. One is Brienne, and the other is Small Paul at the Wall, who is nothing. He is not small. Again, this is a joke. Like the small John, he is massive. Um, and both of those two characters are described at various points as being thick as a castle wall, which, for those who've read Duncan Egg, knows it will know this is quite a heavy hint. Um, okay, let's go to um, Jay saying... Can you discuss the history that we know about the last half? Yeah, I, I'm very happy to. But the short answer is we don't know huge amounts. Uh, we know that this was um, their castle. So it's, it's described as a castle. Um, 
and we know that this was their castle when they were kings when they were kings um, of their own kingdom up there then this was their home base we know it's very far north so it's very cold um, but it is uh, it's in a forest so um not like the map I showed you a little bit earlier, where it was sort of just off to one side of the forest. It's actually in a forest, which I suspect is useful both for uh, protecting against cold northerly winds, but also that far north, it will be very cold and they will need a lot of wood to burn to get through those cold winter evenings. So um, it's clearly a quite a strategic decision to be there. It's also noticeably not on the King's Road, uh, nor, as far as we can tell, is it on a river. This is out of the way. This is uh, not somewhere that you're going to unless you actually are going there. You don't pass by. If you're going from Winterfell up to the Wall, you will still be passing miles and miles away from the last half. So uh, that's largely all we know. Um, it's a strong castle. Um, and the Umbers obviously know how to defend it. Uh, John, when the suggestion comes up that Stannis might um, attack the last hearth, John is very keen to talk him out of it. The, the reason there being that he, the Boltons, had sent their letters out saying everybody now has to sort of bend the knee to us, but at the same time, Stannis had done the same and said everybody has to bend the knee to us. And he gets a, a variety of uh, rather fun replies. We talked about the uh, the one um, that we get from uh, House Mormont. Uh, but the Umber one is basically sort of hedging its bets, as we know. Yeah, some of us are going to go over and bend the knee to uh, House Bolton, but some other of us uh, will come and uh, support you. So um, this is was seen by Stannis loyalists as being uh, not fully uh, throwing the weight of the house uh, behind Stannis. So maybe he should, as it's quite close, maybe he should go and uh, pay it a lesson. Um, and John very quickly says, that's not a good idea. Um, house Umber is also, incidentally, one of the houses that John also mentions uh, in particular as uh, a house who you would lose their support if you started burning weirwood trees. Melisandre at the wall is very keen to burn weirwood trees. This is, this is something that she really, really wants to do. Um, John is offered to be Lord of Winterfell basically in exchange for burning the Winterfell uh, weirwood tree. Um, she wants to go when they go to any new place. To, she wants to be burning weirwood trees. And John basically says to Stannis, if you start doing this, then some northern houses you will never get on your side. And House Umber is one of the ones that he names, uh, which I think has to show, again, this is just like it's a show, not tell, but it has to show that they are more about the uh, the worship of the old gods than many of the other northern families, more than the Boltons say or the Karstarks. Um, the, the, uh, the Umbers are very far north and they are very connected with the old ways of being first men. Um, Jonathan S. says about you mentioning a potential redo of the videos on RR with improved audio to be in the pipeline at some point. RR, uh, I'm having a little bit of a mind blank on what that is. Um, but yeah, just if, so in terms of redoing videos, this is a, a, a sort of a long term plan I have. I'm still, I'm not cutting down on the amount of it. In fact, I've increased the amount of uh, normal videos I'm making. But I'm also wanting to go back to some of the older videos that I've done um, and um, redo them, um, partly because we've got new information or maybe I've got changed my mind a little bit, um, partly also because they um, 
I'm better at making videos these days. They they will look a lot better. So um, yeah, I'm sort of slowly doing that one, maybe two a month. Um, you'll have seen I did some uh, faceless men videos recently. Those were uh, those were redoing, um, updating videos that I did I think five or six years ago. Um, so yeah, th that's that's certainly the plan. I will work my way through sort of a lot of the back catalogue over the next while. I would have thought. Um, oh, Robert's Rebellion. That would be that's what R uh, R R stands for. Yes. So the the Robert's Rebellion series. I will redo. I was trying to work out when the best time to do that is, and I think it has to be when we have more information. Um, and uh, your guess is as good as mine as to when the winds of winter might come out, but I, I've still got hopes for um, the stage play, which we got an update from George R. Martin, I don't know, six months ago or something like that. Um, this is, it's got a name now. It's called The Iron Throne. Um, and this is a stage play about the turning at Harren Hall. Now, surely we will get some extra bits of information there. So uh, probably my Robert's Rebellion series, um, I will redo after we've had that stage play, which he he seemed quite bullish about when it was going to come out. He didn't he, he basically said, well, it might even come out as soon as, uh, well, I don't want to say a date. I don't want to tempt fate um, uh, or words to that effect, uh, which seems to imply that he thought that was quite close. So I don't know. I, I'm not going to guess dates uh, for the winds of winter or anything else that he's producing, but um, I'm hopeful as he is hopeful. Okay. Um, so Luna Cascade asking who the Umber women, wives, daughters, etc. are. Um, what role did Lady Jocelyn Umber play? We don't know is the short answer. Um, the implication is that there's... Um, that's a slightly more traditionalist approach there, um, but we, we're not really told. Um, um, yeah, it, I, I think the short answer is that we're, we're, we're not told. We're, we, we know who the Lord was, we know who the Lord's son and heir was, we know who his two uncles were. Um, we might know names of a couple of um, Umber women, but we're not told huge amounts of detail about them. Uh, Jonathan S. saying, hard to improve on perfection. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, and Andrew K. saying, interested to see your updated take on Tower of Joy. You hinted something about Arthur Dane's role recently. I want to have a look again at that. Um, I haven't finished my thinking on it. Um, the, the Tower of Joy, I don't want to get too distracted off into this, but the Tower of Joy is, I think, still one of the most intriguing uh, bits uh, of the backstory because we don't have any information about it. The only bit of information it is mentioned, fun fact for you, the Tower of Joy is mentioned by name once in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, so uh, it's, it's not big or visible in people's minds at all. The only person who um, was there and can has some knowledge of it is Ned and he clearly he had nightmares about what happened so uh it's clearly important but we don't we just don't have huge amounts of information which is why the stage play and this is why I've got the uh, so many high hopes for the stage play is that yes I'm hoping that maybe or it'll, it'll tell us a few more details about things like the Night of the Laughing Tree and um, uh, mysteries along those lines, but also it will tell us about the characters of who these people are. Someone like Arthur Dane is a mystery. Now, he was a great knight. He was apparently quite noble. He was besties with Rhaegar. But what more do we actually know about him and his character? 
not huge amounts. So um, that's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to. And George R. R. Martin, just so you're aware, he's not the lead writer on this. There are other writers who are there, but he is actively involved. And so what comes from that, we, I think, can expect to be as close to canon as we're going to get. Um, right, let's go... Um, or just the finishing off that, Andrew K saying, I'd be shocked if the stage play came out before the Winds of Winter with some potential crossover reveals, but we will see. Yeah, I, I'd always th I'd always thought the same, um, but George R. R. Martin's progress on the Winds of Winter is is being very slow at the moment. Uh, so I, I suspect that he's going to be left with the situation of, do you want to go ahead with this now or just wait for an indefinite period of time until that book has come out um and i think in that situation probably they could and there are several notable examples in theater history where um they made everybody swear not to reveal the secrets and things like that so i i think that's probably where they're going to be um uh going with it uh, right. Uh, Nicole Stewart from my patrons saying, Hi, Robert. Uh, why did Rob choose Roose Bolton over Great John Umber to lead his second host? How would events change if it was the Great John that was put in command? This is a really interesting question because this is a, a, a plot point. Rob comes up with his plan at Moat Kalin. His plan is that he's going to have two, he's splitting his forces into two. His infantry, the, the bulk of his army, is heading down the King's Road uh, towards Tywin Lannister's main force. He's going to have a smaller, swifter um, uh, group, which is going to get across the river and head down and relieve River Run. And the idea is that they're going to try and do that stealthily so that the that Jamie's force there does not know that they're coming. And splitting his force into two obviously means he has to choose a commander for the force that he's not in. He's decided he's going in the fast-moving ones, uh, heading off to uh, to relieve River Run. So who's he going to put in charge of the main force of infantry? And we have this basically a, a war council uh, and we see this from a cat's perspective and after that's over she comes in and she's talking to rob and she basically she's trying to sort of uh, we we if we're being nice to her she's trying to coach him uh she's only 15 at the time and he's having to make some really big and important strategic decisions um and she asks him questions about his plan, and she clearly, she's clever. George R. R. Martin writes her as a very clever character. And um, she says, you know, what are you going to do? I'll split the armies into two. Um, who are you going to choose as being the commander of the other army, the infantry? And he says, I'm thinking I'm going to go with Great John Umber. And we we hear her thoughts, which is this is his first misstep. He's he's done everything right so far until this moment when he's decided he wants the great John to be uh, leading that army. And she says, "Why?" And he says, "Because um, because he's fearless. He's also loyal. Um, he's he's been ever ever since he challenged Rob's authority. He's been." the most vociferously loyal to Rob Stark um, out of all of his bannermen. Um, because he's fearless, he says. And she basically says, yes, so that's not really what you're wanting. What, you're, what you, you've got is an army that is coming up against a really clever, strong, capable tactician and leader in Tywin Lannister. You don't want somebody who's just fearless and will just charge at him with uh, with the army. We want somebody who is um, cautious and somebody who is clever. And Rob, 
she's obviously leading him here. Rob goes, okay, so that's Ruth Bolton, not um, uh, great your number. And she basically says yes. So that's how it ended up being um, Roos, who was in charge of that army, rather than uh, the Great John. So what would have happened? Uh, these kind of what-if questions are fascinating. Uh, the, the, the truth, when you look at that battle, the Battle of the Green Fork, um, the, the, the two armies, or you, from Tywin's perspective, because we see this Tyrion comes into the camp and he talks to his father and he learns the battle plan. And the battle plan is based on the idea that they thought this was Rob Stark who was leading his army. They thought this was his whole, whole army, Rob Stark coming down south with his whole army. Um, and so Tywin had this cunning plan, basically. He thought, well, Rob Stark, young man, bold, fearless, he's just going to charge at me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put... Um, uh, we, we've got a river on one side here. I'm going to put slight, slightly weaker troops there uh, so that when he charges in, uh, then my force can wheel around the outside and trap him against the river, um, and we should be able to beat him. This is a classic military tactic. Um, but he thinks that Rob will fall into it, uh, into the trap. Um, Bruce Bolton is cautious and doesn't fall for that trap. Uh, they do engage, the two armies do, do engage, but Roose Bolton manages to, having seen that he's outnumbered and outfought, he manages to retreat um, in a way that minimizes his losses. And Tywin is there just sort of basically like, because this, I, I wasn't expecting that, I was expecting Rob to be uh, here, and he's starting to figure out what or there's something going wrong there's 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 something that doesn't quite add up uh now what if great john umber had been in charge well i think the implication from what we've seen and heard is that he would have been he would have done exactly what Tywin lannister wanted him to do which is just charge at the enemy um he would have got himself trapped and they would have taken huge losses so might he have managed to escape? Would he have even tried to escape? Would he have just carried on fighting? Um, I think in any event, that would have been a greater loss for the North. Now, Rob would still have, I'm sure, won uh, the Battle of the Whispering Wood, Battle of the Camps outside uh, River Run. He would have still relieved um, uh, River Run. But... Tywin would have won that battle over on the other bank. And that would have left him, possibly, if that if the northern force there had been completely routed, possibly with a clean run up to the north. Because uh, as as much as Tywin was in Tywin's army was preventing the northern army from getting to King's Landing, the northern army was preventing Tywin from heading north. So all he would have had to do then is either start going north or threaten to go north and Rob would have had to pull back. He would have not been able to do all of his campaign off into the west. Um, he would have had to come back and try and engage or, uh, or, or cut off um, Tywin's uh, forces. And so the whole shape of the war would have changed completely. Rob would maybe he would have been declared king of the north, but he would probably would have had to um, retreat back up to the north, um, try and hold on to River Run and some of the south, perhaps in the Riverlands, but um, he certainly wouldn't have been in the situation he was. He wouldn't have met his future wife. Um, uh, the Red Wedding wouldn't have happened like that. Um, the whole situation would have been very very different so yeah this was quite a fateful uh decision um and it probably shifted the the way that the entire war um happened after that uh 
Stephanie uh, Lash, uh, thank you so much, saying, love your work, Robert. Thank you. It animates my weekly baking. Oh, um, I hope the baking's going well today. Uh, question, what were some of the your biggest surprises as you have reread this story? Um, about the about House Umber in particular, I will um, uh, I will take um, biggest surprises about House Umber. Well, I don't I don't think I had any new surprises about House Umber, but I think that as an emphasis, this uh, this idea that they are, and we'll come on to this in detail, that House Umber are playing a clever game to get the Boltons out um, is is really wonderful. As we're picking through these northern houses, one of the things I'm hoping that you're uh, identifying is the way that the northern houses, we sometimes talk about the great northern conspiracy um, of how the northern houses are going to get rid of House Bolton and reinstate the Starks and um, uh, accept Stannis as the king. Um, the the truth is that it's not as coordinated as that. All these different houses have got slightly different approaches. Um, they're doing slightly different things. And we looked at the Mandalays. The Mandalays have got this plan. We're going to find Rickon, um, uh, and then we're going to get Rickon and put him in into Winterfell. Um, then we've got um, House um, Umber here, who uh, basically seem to be. Uh, we're going to be playing along with them, um, but through guerrilla warfare, we're going to be trying to weaken the the, the Bolton forces and the Bolton sympathizers in Winterfell so that Stannis can attack. They've got a slightly different approach going on. And all of these different um, noble families of the North, they're coming together around Winterfell with their slightly different plans. And we don't know how much they're all talking to each other. Um, surely they are a bit, but a matter in Winterfell, understanding who to trust and who not to trust is uh, incredibly dangerous. So I think that's the thing which has probably come out for me the most um, is is this idea sort of, sort of morphing from this great northern conspiracy to uh, a really complicated picture with lots of different houses trying to do lots of different things in order to achieve, to achieve very similar aims and ends they may be supporting different claim stark claimants um but they are trying to achieve the same thing um let's go to um question from uh, Jay saying, hey, Robert, did the phrase hold Great John captive so that House Umber would be forced to bend the knee to the Boltons, or was it something else they had in mind? Yes, I think that's exactly what, what the, the plan is. Um, and let's not forget that the Red Wedding, we often think of this as being the, the phrase masterminding all of this. And obviously, the phrase were hugely involved, but the Boltons have as much, if not more, of a say here. You get that scene in in the chapter, uh, the Red Wedding chapter, um, uh, in A Storm of Swords. You get, from Kat's perspective, we see this. Uh, you get a short speech given by Roos Bolton. And Kat, again, as I say, she's written as a clever, perceptive character. Roos Bolton gives this short speech where he's saying all the, the right things, but then note, uh, noticeably mentions the fact that currently Big Walder and Little Walder uh, Frey are in um, the Dreadfort. House Bolton has them. And at that point, she notices that Walder Frey starts looking a bit uncomfortable 
because this was a power play by Roose Bolton. He was basically saying, okay, we've reached this point. Uh, I am now reminding you, Walder Frey, that you're going to go through with what we agreed. And if you don't, I've got your family and I, I'm holding them hostage. Uh, so that's the kind of the feel that we've got going on um, between the, the Boltons and the Freys. Um, now, were, were they then holding the Great John captive? Yes. I think that they would have held more captive rather than killed them if they could. Uh, but they had to kill Rob Stark in order for the plan to work to get the Lannisters on site, because that was the whole point, was that the, they want they needed the Lannisters to support them, or support the Boltons, let's be clear, the, the big winners in this are the Boltons, who become Wardens of the North. Um, and in order to do that, they needed to kill Rob, also Grey Wind, of course, um, and cat although they could have kept cat prisoner um the fact that they kept great john umber as a prisoner this was a specific decision they they could have just killed him um it, he took people down he was he had to be wrestled down as i say it was eight people hadn't eventually it took to wrestle him down um the easiest thing the easiest thing would have been to actually kill him they had so many crossbowmen um uh, that would have worked a whole lot better than just trying to basically tie him up uh, and that kept house umber on side if Great John Umber was not um, a prisoner, if he'd been killed, the Umbers would have just... I mean, there's there's no reason for them to go along with the Boltons. They could have just said no. And, and this, you'll find, is the same with the Mandalays. This was not just a let's pick on the Umbers. The Mandalays also, their heir, had been held as a hostage by the Lannisters. They had to play nice until they could get their heir back. So um, the, the use of hostages was a well-worn tactic in, in Westeros. And this, yes, very specific. We're, we're going to get the Umbers on side by making sure we keep uh, Great John Umber. Uh, right. Um, yeah, Northern Tommy saying, also seems very short-sighted to kill Cat when she could have been a hostage. But I guess they didn't really need too many hostages. Um, I'm confusing myself. So, so the Starks, the Starks, the idea was just to get rid of them. Um, uh, Kat, yes, they could have kept her as a hostage, but she uh, she was not playing nice in, um, in the uh, the Red Wedding. So um, uh, th there's also a sort of a personal thing there. You'll you'll see with the House Frey is that Kat's body. The reason why she she got washed up, why she got found, um, was because they wanted to mock her by giving her um, a sort of a, a sham of a House Tully funeral rite. We know the funeral rites of House Tully. We've seen it. You put them in a boat. You push the boat down the river. You burn the boat. Uh, that's what it is. But they were just like, no, this is just like a fish. We'll just throw her into the river. Um, uh, that that was them mocking her because the phrase... Uh, or actually taking a step back, the Tullys are relatively recent lords of the Riverlands. Um, now, when they used to be, when when uh, Aegon's invasion happened, the the kings of the Riverlands, the Isles and the Rivers, this was King Harren Hall, uh, Harren Hall, Harren the Black. Um, he built Harren Hall. Um, he was the strongest uh, there in the Riverlands. And then when he died, Aegon obviously had to decide who is it I'm going to make the new Lord Paramount of the Riverlands. 
and he could look around and he decided that he was going to make the family he thought would be most loyal in charge, which is the Tullys, because they had been the first to bend the knee to him. Now, the River Lords had never really got over this because the House Tully was, it wasn't the richest, it wasn't the oldest, it wasn't the most honourable, it wasn't the... Uh, you know, the the most powerful. It just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And there were plenty of houses in the Riverlands that felt that they should have been uh, next in line. And the phrase, although they are a relatively recent house themselves, are one of the richest houses in the Riverlands. They definitely felt uh, that the Tullys probably are not deserving of as much respect as you might think. So uh, there's a, and added to which, Hoster Tully and Walder Frey, not much love lost. They made up nicknames for each other, uh, rather derogatory ones. So this is, um, uh, th this is a, a personal thing. That's why they... They killed Cat, I think. Um, Martin S., what do you think Jon Snow's opinion of Catelyn Tully or Stark was? What do you think Jon Snow's opinion of Davis Seaworth was? Um, well, Cat, um, moving a little bit away from the umbers here, but the, the, so Cat really didn't like John because she saw him as her husband's bastard um, who she had absolutely no problem with actually she had no problem with um, uh, her husband having a bastard son from the war um, they literally only her and Ned had literally only just met and uh, lots of lords had bastard children around uh, she just wanted him to um, uh, pay for his upkeep and keep him away from her children. But Ned didn't. He brought him into Winterfell and raised him like he's, you know, alongside uh, his children that he had with Cat. So she hated John right from the start. Um, uh, John, he never seems to hate her back, but obviously he's very wary of her um and uh th there's no there's no love there I, I think he could he respected her uh, but definitely no no real love in terms of his opinion of davos seaworth i would have to have a look at that again i have to admit that nothing immediately comes to mind but um he is the kind of person um that you think John probably would like because he's he's very open, very straightforward, very honest, um, and John can be too. Um, Catherine Firseth saying, "How does this playing nice fit in with the Northern sense of loyalty and duty?" In, in terms of, if you're talking in terms of the um, uh, the the families, the noble families that are there. Um, pretending to battle, ben, actually bending the knee to the Boltons, uh, but in secret plotting against them. How does that fit with these kind of no loyalty? They see that they've got a loyalty to House Stark. I think that's how this all works. The Boltons are not really their lords. Um, so uh, the, they are obeying their first loyalty in that. And their family ties are hugely strong and so they're being forced into this not just by strength of arms if this was just strength of arms i suspect that uh Mandalese and the umbers and others would just say no but it's their family who have been um, held prisoner um Caris Ballerina, isn't there some tinfoil that Tormund's eldest son, the super tall one, might have been from a kidnapped Umber lady when Tormund was younger? Uh, yes, I think so. But the thing is with Tormund is that he is a teller of tales, um, some of which may well be true, and many of which 
may not be true. Uh, so this is why you can get lots of legends around him. So you get the she bear legends and stories uh, with the Mormont Major Mormont. Is he perhaps you know lover of uh, of one of the Mormonts and they're so uh, they're his children. Um, this is another legend about him. Um, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Um, is there any evidence for it? Not really, I don't think. Um, let's go to Mara Lee saying, House Umber initially were first men kings, then over time eventually became fiercely loyal bannermen to House Stark. Um, I'm curious to know uh, what you think will be House Umber's role in the last two books, especially since we have a stark succession crisis? Who do you think they would want as king or queen or warden of the north? Well, I mean, this is an interesting one because they, um, uh, what, what their role is, is to be a northern house. I think it, that part of the um, uprising against the um uh, the boltons and in the slightly longer term also they're the most northerly house on the mainland so this is where we're going to get information about um the wildlings heading south and if the others do cross the wall and head south I think they definitely will go as they did on the TV show. I think they will go to the last half. Um, that seems to be what the others were doing north of the wall. Is they're not they're not just uh, heading as fast as they can down south. They are dawdling a bit, uh, and they're just making sure they clear out all of the north before they can, uh, all of north of the wall before they then head south of it. And I think that they will do the same south of the wall as well. So. House Umber will be the uh, the first to fall if that is where that storyline is going. In terms of who they would want to be there, I don't think. Um, although yes, they want they they hate the Boltons. They want the Boltons out. The Frey's gone. Um, they want the Starks back in. Um, it really is, I think, who can show that they're the leader. Now. When you get to this, obviously Stannis is going to be there and we all know what Stannis is like. But one of the key points about John is the way that, although he doesn't seem to seek leadership positions, he he naturally is a leader. He is the kind of person that people rally around. It wasn't just an accident that he... Um, got voted Lord Commander. Yes, Sam was doing a lot of things behind the scenes. Yes, we get uh, Mormont's Raven had a big role to play, but people voted for him because they could see his leadership qualities as much as anything else. Those uh, those last couple of chapters, John's chapters, it's... Um, uh, I've, I've just finished uh, my very slow re-listen through Storm of Swords. And it's noticeable that those last couple of chapters, um, when John is at Castle Black, just before he gets made Lord Commander, the uh, Alistair Thorne and Jenna Slint come across uh, from uh, Eastwatch and basically take control of Castle Black uh, away from John because he has he's been made de facto the uh, head of uh, the defense of castle black when the wildlings were attacking john snow the wall is yours they people were saying this to him he was the leader um as a thorn uh john slint come in and they they hate him and they immediately depose him and what does john do he goes to the practice yard and he teaches people how to fight because he's he's been castle trained he's there teaching people he is taking on a leadership role without even thinking that this is what he's doing he is taking on a leadership role amongst those people who then later vote for him we're, we're shown this uh that 
the the people there who need to learn how to fight he trains he takes on he just does what he does naturally and people treat him as a leader and i think if we're taking the umbers as being this uh family who more than most in the north will not just be bowing the knee to somebody because they've got the name stark they they will bow the knee to somebody who they see has proven their worth i think we will see john snow prove his worth to them and i think that they would follow him um okay let's go to a question uh, from Travis saying, hello, Robert. Happy Thursday and to you too. To what extent do you think House Umber is involved in the conspiracy to undermine House Bolton? There isn't much, but the two lines of evidence I see are, one, Theon seeing Hothor talking quietly, dare, dare I say, conspiring with Harwood Stout, and two, Moors and Hothar splitting House Umber when those two have previously seemed aligned. Roos himself states that, states that pardon me, states that the umbers may seem simple, but they are not without a certain low cunning. Okay, so are, what are they what are they actually doing? Um, are they are they involved in this conspiracy? So Theon does see and, and Theon is a he's our eyes and ears in Winterfell during this period. Um, he's not always the best of witnesses. But um, he certainly sees um, uh, Horsebane talking to uh, this uh, other other lord, uh, this guy called Harwood Stout, who we don't we don't really. I mean, how Stout is down um, uh, one of the vassals of Barbary Dustin, um, House Dustin. Um, now they're sort of talking in soft voices, um, conspiring. Uh, the situation we have um, in Winterfell, as I said, it's very complex because um, the Boltons are clearly in charge. They've got the a lot of Freys up there with them who are clearly on their side as well. Then you get lots of other northern houses who've all, for various reasons, come to either... Uh, bend the knee or to show their support or because they've been ordered to uh we get the rice wells the dustins um we get the mandalies um we got um the the umbers as well and lots of other random houses out there and it's it's as if they're all just trying to feel out where people are because everyone is pretending to be loyal to the Boltons, because they have to pretend to be loyal to the Boltons. But um, you're right, I think, that this is a hint. The fact that they're sort of conspiring, talking, these two people, does seem to imply that they're just trying to suss out what's going on. Um, the fact that uh, Hothor and Moors have um, split House Umber and yet we don't hear of there being a big rift between them two, does seem to imply that they are still, they're on the same team, but they're doing the minimum that they have to do to show uh, support for the Boltons in order to make sure that the Great John is safe and okay. Uh, but um, Moores is clearly outside undermining uh, the Boltons. This does, and... Uh, Somebody asked me, um, let me just quickly check, um, asked me, uh, oh yeah, Tazta uh, saying, what's your favourite theory that involves House Umber? My favourite theory, this is connected in, uh, in with this question about what's going on in Winterfell. Uh, my favourite theory is the snowmen theory. Now, I don't know if you've come across this, but this is, uh, this is something Theon again, Theon notices, is that... Um, on the inner curtain wall, there are two uh, curtain walls, walls that go around the outside um, of uh, Winterfell. And the inner curtain wall is the higher one. The inner curtain wall, uh, there are some snowmen being built uh, by some, um, I can't remember what, 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 what exactly they're 
they're called squires and the like basically is the implication there are some more snowmen being built there's lots of snow uh, there's some more snowmen being built down in the sort of the, the courtyards and places like that but there's a, a noticeable thing about these snowmen which is that these aren't just snowmen uh, they have been put up onto the ramparts so they can be seen obviously from outside as well as inside and they have been made very clearly to look like specific nobles now one of them is lord wyman manderley who is a rather rotund gentleman um lord too fat to sit a horse he is called um uh, so he is made in detail another is um hothor umber himself he's got this very exaggerated huge beard um that's there another is barbary dustin who is a very thin uh woman she has a snow person uh made of her um and there's one or two others that uh, escape me and so we're getting images of people put on top of this wall where they can be seen from outside my favorite theory i i didn't come up with this myself i've i've seen it around and about um no idea who first thought of this um but this is communication between the umbers because we know that moore's umber is outside winterfell just outside who will be able to see the top of the wall uh the higher wall uh these very obvious snowmen snow people of some of the significant characters there it's noticeable that there's no snowman of roos bolton there's no snowman of any of the phrase this is just people who probably are not 100 percent behind the boltons certainly at least a couple of them are not behind the boltons so if we were to work on that i think reasonable assumption that the the brothers the umber brothers um decided to split their forces one was going to be inside winterfell one was going to be outside winterfell they needed to be able to communicate with each other what's the fundamental thing they needed to be able to understand is who is on our side who when whenever the gates open whenever the big battle happens which houses are actually stark loyalists when you get down to it which houses uh are, are we expecting to be with us and so the the theory goes that um Hothor, perhaps others but Hothor umber is getting people once he has found out he's talking to people he's whispering he's finding out what's going on once he realizes who is on his side he gets his squires up there make a snow person of that person that house so that we know these guys are on our side so that's my favorite uh random theory about uh about the umbers and it's one of those ones where it, it is there any evidence that this is the case? No, we've never heard anyone giving instructions about you now have to make this person, this no person, you now have to make that snow person. But it fits and it feels really good and fun, doesn't it? Um, it's exactly the kind of thing we surely that the, the two Umber brothers are still um close. Surely we know that they are both wanting to get rid of uh, the Boltons. Surely the bit of information that is most key for that to be communicated um, is who's on our side. Building snow people is, uh, is a, a fantastic way of trying to do that. So that's my, uh, that's my favorite theory that I've seen uh, working on that. And I'm sure somebody has got a really good name for that. The theory, the snow people theory. Um, uh, yeah, Northern Tommy saying that's what I was thinking about the snow people. Don't kill these people when you conduct your stealth raid. Yeah, exactly. It's it's as simple as that. I mean, there there are some. So Barbara Dustin, she's very complex character, um, uh, and her loyalties are not always the easiest to uh, work out. But you probably don't want to kill her <laughs> um, when if if you do launch a raid into Winterfell in some way, you 
probably don't want to. Snowspiracy, uh, Lucian, excellent. I like that. Um, uh, okay, let's uh, let's go to a question from Diego Godoy saying, um, "Hola, Robert. Hola." Um, in fact, actually, just at this point. I just need to do my thank yous first. Uh, two thank yous, as always. Uh, the first thank you is to my patrons. I hugely appreciate you. Um, uh, I can't do what I do without you. And uh, thank you so much. If you would like to support this channel, uh, the best way to do that is through Patreon. There'll be a link if you're watching live, wherever your live chat is. I'm sure one of the moderators will put that up there. If you're watching this back a bit later, then down in the description, there will be a link across. But it's patreon.com slash indeepgeek. And secondly, uh, moderators... You are amazing. Uh, if you are watching this live, then the people who are making sure that the live chat is uh, the the place that uh, a place of safety, a place of uh, fun uh, and uh, endless great comments um, is the moderators. So if you are in the live chat, uh, could you just send a little bit of love to the moderators? Um, I would hugely appreciate that. OK, uh, let's get back to the questions. Diego Godoy, hola, Robert. Do you think the great John will survive his imprisonment? Um, and Michelle Rimo saying, hi, Robert, do you think we will ever see the great John alive again? He's currently a prisoner and a staunch, staunch Stark loyalist. If the Boltons think there's any chance of losing, Stan losing to Stannis in the Winds of Winter, do you think they would kill their remaining loyalist prisoners? Um, uh, finally, when John is resurrected in the Winds of Winter, I believe he will march to the south to defend Winterfell. If the great John escapes imprisonment alive, do you think he would support John as Ned's only surviving son or not due to his bastardry? Right, so will will the great John survive? Well, I think physically he will survive the captivity. I, I think it's in everybody's best interests to keep him alive. However, he will be transported down south from the twins towards King's Landing at some point. I think it is um, incredibly likely that that and the others, just to paint the picture of what's going on in the Riverlands, the Riverlands, if you think the North is complicated, the Riverlands is even more complicated. Uh, the, there's going to be several different uh, sort of prisoner trains going if that's the right way of, of putting it uh heading off to so uh, rob's uh widow is going to be sent off into the westerlands uh edmure tully is similarly going to be sent off there and then all the prisoners in the twins are going to be sent off down to the south now there are as i said a little bit earlier in this stream so many different groups who would very probably step step in to stop those um and uh i think that will happen i think that the the symbolism that we talked again earlier about the sigil for house umber of a giant breaking free from his tr his chains i love this idea that this is foreshadowing for great john umber breaking free from his chains he is a hugely strong character um now <coughs> pardon me uh, does this mean he's going to survive? I think he'll survive being um, locked up in uh, the Twins. Whether he will survive um, uh, what happens afterwards, I don't know. But the key point is, if he dies or if he escapes, suddenly House Umber no longer has to pretend to be supporting House Bolton. The moment that that news gets to them, it, it's the same as, as it happened with House Manderley. Now House Manderley is just waiting for the moment to strike. House Umber is going to be exactly the same. So the moment that we get either of those outcomes, and one of those outcomes I'm pretty sure will happen, either he dies somehow or he gets free, um, that's when House Umber will... Uh, will move. The The thing is that he's now very far south, it has to be said. He's at the Twins, so he's not in the north. He's um, he's going to head south from, uh, from there, um, 
and probably if he if if his sort of prisoner train does get um ambushed at some point then he will find himself some point in the middle riverlands perhaps that's a long way south it would take him months to travel all the way back up north again which isn't to say that he wouldn't um but uh, that's a very long journey all the way that far north um will uh, will the great john uh, support john snow as ned's only surviving son <laughs> or not due to his bastardry. So, uh, Great John Umber is a witness to Rob's will. I've got a, a, a video coming out, maybe even tomorrow, on Rob's will, because it's fascinating what that that whole um, uh, little kind of subplot, really. I'll, I'll give you a flavour, because I always spoil my own videos before they come out. But basically, Rob... Before the Red Wedding, he suddenly realised that he was in this problem that nobody knew if he died, who was going to take over, who was going to be king after him. Because as far as he was aware, Bran and Rickon are dead. Um, Arya has gone missing and he thinks is dead. And Sansa is now married to the Lannisters, married to Tyrion. And this... Everybody knew this is Tywin's cunning plan uh, to get Winterfell. Is to if Tyrion and Sansa have children, then they have a claim to Winterfell. So, what Rob needed to do was to take Sansa out of the line of succession, and then say, "Who, who am I going to have as my heir?" Now we don't see it actually written down, but it's ninety nine percent certain and clear that he chooses John. Um, he chooses th that uh, in order to make John his heir, he has to legitimize him first um, and then make him his heir. So that's what his will says. And the great John knows this. He didn't object to it at the time. Um, and so John is no longer a bastard in the eyes of the law. Uh, he has been uh, legitimized by a king, King Rob. Um, so there is, and as we've said, he is a natural leader and the kind of leader that the Umbers, I suspect, would follow. So for me, it all adds up that, yeah, they would get in behind John as being uh, the new lord. Um, Darius Hutchinson saying, will the Tullys take over the twins after the Red Wedding 2.0? Um, okay, Red Wedding 2.0, um, is, is the thinking that basically something like what happened on the show when Arya went in and killed all of the, uh, the phrase, um, something like that will happen in the books. Now, it may or may not be Arya. I think there's a fair to medium chance Lady Stoneheart might get involved in this. Um, so would the um, the Tullys take it over? I mean, I don't know whether... I mean, they, they would take it over, but whether they would actually be ruling it themselves from there, I, I don't know. Um, it doesn't... Uh, I mean, it's strategically important, so they would put somebody there, uh, but uh, who is a different matter. Actually, this is the kind of thing that maybe the um, the chat might have a few ideas about. I'll, I'll read out some of the, the best ideas. But if if we do get some sort of Red Wedding 2.0, if if the the twins do come back into um, Tully Stark control in some way. Who who should be left there? Who should be left there in charge? Uh, let me know in the chat. Uh, Weirwood Net just saying a thank you to you and the mods. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, Andrew K saying we've seen these legitimization decrees and offers. Rob likely offers it, as does Stannis to John. Maester Eamon was offered it. Uh, but have any actually come to fruition in the histories? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, so, well, legitimization, I mean, the the biggest 
legitimization obviously was Aegon the Fourth, who on his deathbed he legitimized all of his great masters. Um, and that caused no manner of problems. This uh, led uh, in many ways to um, the Blackfire rebellions. So yes, we we do see this happen uh, sometimes, um, but uh, not always with a good um, a good outcome. Actually, th th this uh, just thinking about Rob's will. Um, that's one of the arguments that Cat comes up with for n not doing it with John, not legitimizing John. She says, look, you know, the Blackfires, uh, Damon Blackfire got legitimized, and look how many years that caused problems for um, the Seven Kingdoms. This is what happens. Um, let's go to uh, Curse Ballerina. Do you think his championing of the Free Folk will harm John's reputation with the Umbers? Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. So the Umbers, uh, we haven't really emphasised this. I mean, we've sort of mentioned it a bit, but the Umbers, out of all of the northern households, with the possible exceptions, I suppose, of the Mormons, come into contact with the wildlings um, uh, on a semi-regular basis. Now, the, also, they have a very close personal... Um, issue so Moore's Umber, uh, crew food, his daughter was taken in a, a raid by the wildlings. He has got serious, he seriously hates the wildlings, uh, because of this. And the Umbers generally do they they raised this was the issue they raised when they came across uh, Hathor and Moors the fact that the, the wildlings were starting to attack. This is why they wanted a navy, the wildlings are coming south, something has to be done. So um, uh, they really don't like the wildlings. Um, John has um, allowed the wildlings in, but it's probably worth pointing out that, um, first of all, that the Umbers are not really aware of everything that's been going on at the wall. Um, uh, this is in time of winter, the messages get it's really hard to be communicating across distances we know what happened at the wall uh, but they don't really know all that happened at the wall um and the people who came through you can blame stannis as much as you can john yes john was lord commander and kind of allowed it um uh, but there, uh, Stannis was the person calling the shots, saying they can come in as long as they bend the knee to me. Um, what John did was um, he then said, okay, the wildlings, you can go off and you can man the abandoned castles on the wall. That's where you can go. And it, So he's not actually sending them south. Uh, which I think was the implication that happened on the, on the TV show, but he's actually mostly keeping them at the wall. Uh, so is this going to cause a problem for the Umbers? Yes, probably. But uh, what we have to see at some point in the Winds of Winter is this shift in, from worrying about who's being Lord and and this house and that house to hang on a moment, there's an existential threat coming from the north. The others are on their way. And House Umber, as well as being the house that has the most contact with the wildlings, also they are the closest to the wall and they will be the people who first understand about the, in the south of the wall, first understand about the others, uh, not the Night's Watch, um, after the Night's Watch. So, um, Yes, in the short term, but in the medium term, no. I think everything will pale into insignificance compared to the threat from the others. Um, Fit Dad Chris saying, I sent a message on Patreon with a question for you. Yeah. Um, uh, off topic, but I wanted to ask for months now, just when you get a chance. Uh, okay, I... Didn't catch that one before um, I went live, but I'll try and uh, find that. Um, 
let's go to um, Steve Ash Lerner Turner saying, hi, Robert and Dan, putting a question in the general chat because it's too long for this. Um, OK, so the question is, when uh, Rob legitimized John, as far as he knew, John was a member of the watch. Wouldn't that mean John, even if legitimized, would be ineligible to become Lord of Winterfell? Um, well, rules are made to be broken. And clearly kings think that they can uh, change the, the way of it, the way of things. Stannis offers John, before he gets made Lord Commander, Stannis offers to legitimize John and make him Lord of Winterfell. The implication in that is to is that he is going to free him from his Night's Watch vows. Um, that is basically what Rob is doing here. Uh, now, this is complicated by the fact that, um, well, firstly, John is made... Um, Lord Commander, which was as much as anything else, there were a number of different threads to it, but as much as anything else, it stopped, it prevented John from uh, accepting Stannis's offer. Um, uh, but also, John is going to be dead. So we don't know when the information comes to John, um, but he will be freed from his Night's Watch vows. And I suspect the exact reason why he's free. Um, yes, we we all know the technical get around that he died and the Night's Watch oath is until his death. Um, so if he died and then comes back, he's free from it. Uh, also, clearly, it's possible to um, uh, for a king to free somebody from the Night's Watch vows. With Maester Aemon, um, the when he was a maester, uh, he was offered uh, the Iron Throne. He was that some lords wanted him to become king, and clearly they didn't think this was a problem. Yeah, he was a he was a maester, which should mean that he's disavowed absolutely everything. But you know, you can just um, overrule that if you want to. So yeah, this is it. I think sometimes we we approach these kind of matters with a. A sort of a modern Western legal mind, um, what technically is allowed. King can do kings can do what they want, and if a king says, "I'm uh, legitimizing you, I'm uh, getting you out of the Night's Watch, I'm doing this," then that's what's happening in that realm. Um, Oh, Andrew K saying to clarify, that's what I meant with the legitimization question. Have we ever seen oaths broken by these decrees like the Night's Watch or Citadel, um, etc.? Um, have we seen it? Uh, no immediate examples come to mind, but it's very clear, as I said, it's very clear that in the mind of kings, they can do what they want. Um, Right, let's go to um, Catherine Furseth saying, Hi, Robert. Uh, house Umber is interesting because it's the northernmost located house on mainland Westeros. How do you think this affects the temperament and understanding of history that this house has? Being so close to the wall, they're closer to and more often in contact with the wildlings, for example, and more affected by raids from them. But do you think they are perhaps also more like wildlings in culture than other houses? It is said that House Umber helped the Starks to defeat the uh, the brother kings beyond the wall, Gendel and Gorn, far back in history. What does this tale tell us about the Umbers? Um, I, I think I covered Gendel and Gorn, Gorn, Gendel and Gorn a little bit ago. But uh, this issue of um, the character of the house, I've I've touched it on it from num from a number of different angles. So I'll kind of summarise this here. They are very northern. Uh, they are first men. They are clearly very strongly worshipping the old gods. They allegedly still keep some of the old ways. They are cut off from most of... The, I mean, this is true for a number of northern houses, but they're cut off from most of the rest of uh, Westeros. You're only going to go there if you're going there. You never, you're never passing through en route to somewhere else. 
There are hints that uh, they might be, uh, or they are associated with even older um, uh, things like giants, um, and that they follow the feel a lot more of the wildling approach to you follow the strong leader, not just somebody because they happen to be the heir. So all of the clues that we've got is that this is a very, very northerly house. If you imagine what a northerly house is like, this is House Umber. What does this say about the character of them? Well, and, and the link across to the wildlings, well, they are portrayed as being quite wild, <laughs> um, which is, sounds like the most obvious point, which probably is the most obvious point. But um, when when they first arrive in Winterfell, the, the Umber soldiers come boisterously, uh, I mean, they, it sounds like they've been drinking, boisterously singing, and uh, everything that Great John Umber does is just loud and big, um, leaping to his feet, charging at things uh, larger than life. Their hair, huge beards, the, the, the height makes them stand out. They are wild. That's, that's how they are. Not as wild, perhaps, as Skagos, the island that is actually not that far from them, um, uh, or perhaps the wildlings north of the wall, but they have got more of that to them than most of the other houses in the north. Um, Rabab Asan saying, John is no Stark, better to have a dragon at the wall. No. Um, yeah, people don't know this is the first thing. And secondly, uh, I think Stannis, people will come around to Stannis's idea on this one, I suspect, that the first thing that is needed is for the north not to be at loggerheads uh it, it needs the north needs to be united or you'll never be able to confront the threat from the others so that's the first point get everybody united behind someone then you can uh, focus uh, on the north so uh, yes um and then the other thing i would just very um I mean, we'll look, look at House Stark maybe next week. Um, but yes, the wall is this defensive line against the others. Uh, but the, the clues and hints are there that Winterfell is also from way back in time, that sort of time, and also is a significant part of the defense of the yeah. North and indeed the entire continent against the others. So um, it's not like Winterfell's just a castle. Uh, what we know of as Winterfell is, it's the Weirwood tree, it's the old keep, and it's the crypts, crucially the crypts, I think. But we'll come back to that next time. Um, Martin S. saying, yes, the king is probably in modern political science terms, the legislature, executive and judiciary all packed into a single person. Yeah, exactly. The king, uh, the king can do what the king wants to do. Is the, you mean you said it far more eloquently than me, but that's basically what it is. Um, Let's go to uh, Commander Ray. The Umbers are a fierce and wild house, yet staunchly loyal to House Stark. In the show, Small John Umber chooses the Boltons because John let the wildlings settle the gift. Do you think something similar might happen in the books, or will the Umbers remain loyal to the Starks? And do you think the Umbers will be wiped out like they were in the show? Well, the Umbers are partly wiped out already. Their army has been wiped out. Um, uh, I, I've covered already the the issues of the Umber loyalty. I think it's pretty clear that they are pretending to, at least half pretending, to uh, fall in line with the Boltons, uh, but in re reality they're not. They're plotting and conspiring uh, to bring the Boltons down. Um, will they all be destroyed? I mean, it's it's hard, it's hard to say what's going to happen in I mean in the winds of winter, but in a dream of spring, even further forward, um, 
who knows but i think i will say this which is that um the others are a huge existential threat to all of humanity and uh on the tv show uh we really only had yes we saw this tiny little bit of uh the and it was quite it was gruesome if you remember it i think i think it was the end of episode two um from the last hearth showing that the others had been there um but uh the others assuming they break through the wall they will be heading south bringing freezing cold conditions with them darkness with them it's going to feel like the end of days as night starts to creep across the continent um if you had to pick a house who is first in the firing line it's house umber um so uh, i don't think they will all be destroyed i suspect that there will probably be some who um, stick around at Winterfell, or maybe, maybe even the Great John stays down south. But um, uh, if you had to pick a house, and George R. Martin will have to, I suspect, show us uh, in some way the power of the others. Um, if you had to pick a house, then yeah, House Umber. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that I think actually is my last question from my patrons about the Umbers. I've got one more question from a patron uh to go but now is a great time to drop some more questions into the chat um uh andrew k asking will we come back to the dustins cast arcs and glover types soon after the house stark stream um yeah so i think i haven't decided exactly what i'm going to be uh covering uh i don't want to do every house in the north so I will have to draw the, the line at some point. Um, I obviously do want to do House Stark. Uh, maybe what I will do um, is cover the rest of the North um, in a live stream. So maybe cover the Dustin's Cast Arts Glovers and, you know, pick your own house right as well, whatever. Uh, the all of the rest of them in, in another one. So let me know in the chat what you think about that, because as I say, um, I don't don't want to, and I, I think that there's a law of diminishing returns here in terms of uh, how, how much value people will get from me uh, looking at increasingly um, small and uh, slightly irrelevant houses. Um, I'm keen to move on to the rest, not just talking about the North, but move on to the rest of Westeros as well, looking at some uh, intriguing houses elsewhere. Um, uh, all the rest of it, Andrew. Yes, there's, we can call that one. Um, uh, let's go with... Um, yeah, last question from my patrons. This was Lady Pushkins. Um, hi there. Um, saying, good evening, Robert. Sorry, off topic, but how does the Westerosi calendar work? Is it moon counting? How do you know when your name day is, um, as in the day or month? Okay, so very happy. Just, just a little factual um, nugget here. Yes, it's done, as far as we can tell. George R. Martin doesn't he doesn't talk about dates and things all that much, it has to be said. Uh, so the clear implication is that it's not seen as important. But yes, so we, he has said very clearly on a number of occasions that the Planetos year is exactly the same length as a year here. Um, so, um, and yes, the seasons are out of balance. Uh, but they mark the year regardless. So one revolution of their sun, effectively. And that is then split into moon turns. Uh, so, and then days within that. So you would be um, on the fourth day of the third moon of the year. That's your name day or whatever. So that's uh, that's the way that they work it. Um, they don't, as I say, he doesn't get into this hugely, um, which 
I don't know. I've always found a little bit of a gap in his world building because clearly the seasons being out of balance is so significant in the backstory here. Um, the how that then trans um, translates across into how you measure the passage of time, I would have thought would be a hugely in, in interesting part of this world development. Um, but it's his world, and uh, perhaps he's less interested in that than I am. Um, so yeah, it's moons and days within the moon, and a year there is a year here. Um, uh, right, let's have a quick flick through the chat. Um, um, so Agreed Weirwood saying, if they have 365 days, then 13 months of 28 days matches the moon and a leap day for the rest. Yeah, quite possibly. He's to say he doesn't give us these details. Um, he does. Um, it's, it's fair to say that there are some things that George R. R. Martin actually quite likes keeping vague. Another one of those things is... Um, is is exact timings of like travels and how to get to one place to another. He he enjoys the vagueness of it, uh, particularly when you're going back into Robert's Rebellion as an example. He he says that he has kept it deliberately vague. Now, how long it took somebody to travel from one place to another place. So, uh, when we're talking about dates of birth, um, it is specific. It's deliberately supposed to be. A little bit unclear so we, we never get Danny just going hey it's my name day I was born on such and such a time or uh, John saying you know oh let's let's all have a party because I was born on such and such a day it's it's played down and I mean I, I do wonder whether this is because uh, because so much of the backstory is to do with who was born when um, if he was a lot more clear and specific about exactly what somebody's birth date was, then that might give away a few too many clues. Um, Cash Ballerina, why does Horsbane not become a maester? Does it have to do with possibly being LGBT or the whore incident? And will Ned Umber have a book role? Um, Right, so Horsbane, so this is Hothor Umber. Now, uh, the the Hor incident um, happened down in Old Town. The, the, we're not told all of the backstory here, but basically this, yes, this was a sex worker who he rather gruesomely killed. And the implication is that this was a male sex worker. Um, he was down in Old Town studying um why didn't he become a maester i think the clear implication is that that just there was too much scandal and so he went back up north again that's the the kind of the implication of it where we're not told all the details um will ned umber have a book role so ned umber you will remember was the child um the umber child who uh we met in uh, the last season, perhaps the last couple of seasons of um, Game of Thrones, and he rather gruesomely was killed by the others. So, uh, are we are we going to meet him? Well, there will be an equivalent of um, a new heir. Great John Umber has several children, boys and girls. We're told. Uh, so, with um, both horse, um, Horsebane and um, Crowfood away from um, the last hearth, then there's somebody in charge there. And I, th I think the suggestion has to be this is going to be another one of um, Great John's children. Um, maybe they're going to be called Ned. Who knows? Are they going to fulfill the same exact role? Uh, on the TV show, Ned Umber's role basically was for us to go, oh, that's a cute kid now being in charge of the Umbers, and now he's being killed on the others horrible. That was, I mean, I'm being slightly tongue-in-cheek about it, but that was basically his role. Are we going to have an Umber playing that role? No. Uh, 
but that doesn't mean that something similar won't happen. As I say, if you had to pick one uh, major house to um, get absolutely decimated by the others, it probably would be House Umber. Um, Karis Ballerina um, is the great John naming Rob King what ultimately killed him. Um, uh, I mean, in, in a way you could say that, but at the same time, even if he hadn't been named King, he would still have been uh, trying to achieve the same things he wanted to achieve, um, which was um, to get, uh, well, initially to get release of his father, but then also um, prisoner swap for Sansa and um, Arya, while well, they thought Arya was alive, um, uh, and to get some sort of degree of justice. Uh, if he had not been made king, I suspect that maybe he might have just um, returned home quicker, because the issue, the issue was that he wasn't just king of the north. We often think of him as being king of the north, and that's what um, the the great John was calling for, calling him king in the north. But then the Riverlands lords also pronounced him king. So suddenly John, uh, not John, Rob was king of the north and the Riverlands, and so he had to, he couldn't just go back to the north and go, fine, that's it, we'll stay here then. He then had the Riverlands to be looking after as well. Uh, could there be a link between the Horn of Joramon, uh, Waking Giants, and the Umbers? Oh, interesting. So there is a link with the um, uh, with horns and the umbers, it has to be said. Um, there, uh, now one of the umbers, and I forget which one, when telling the tale of uh, basically what happened there uh, with the Knights King, he he blew, um, uh, he blew a horn and. Uh, so there's some imagery going on there. Uh, in terms of the legend is that the, the Horn of Juramon will wake giants from the earth. Uh, m might that be the Umbers? My instinct is no. If you've, if you've watched this channel for a long time, you'll know that my, my working theory is that that is actually connected with the Winterfell crypts. Maybe we'll talk about this when we talk about House Stark. Um, I've done a video on it somewhere, but um, if you... Uh, there's too much detail to go into right here and right now, but the statues in the Winterfell crypts are giant size. You, it, they're, they're never really said as much but then whenever you um just actually see the descriptions of them they're looking down on people um eye height appears to be you know only part way up the the body these are huge statues and this so these i think this is those are the giants from the earth rather than house umber um Dave Mason saying, first time catching the live stream, uh, but I go to sleep to your videos every night. Keep up the great work. So, well, thank you. Uh, I hugely appreciate it. Um, um, I think a quick flick through. Uh, Kelly Summers saying, if he hadn't been made king, he might have been able to ally with Stannis more easily. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I did, uh, Andrew Kay saying, speaking of the Umbers, the current state of the North is... Uh, it's probably my biggest frustration waiting for the winds of winter. George R. R. Martin needs to put things right. Yeah, I know. I know that feeling. It's um, it's it's complex and it's also heartrending having the the Boltons and the Freys um, have having done the Red Wedding and they're they're still profiting from it. Um, yeah, very frustrating. Um, okay, I think. Um, 
with that, uh, let's start talking about what's coming up next on the channel. So next week I will do House Stark. Um, uh, we've been sort of pushing that back a, a, a few weeks, but let's do House Stark next week because that obviously um, links all of the Northern Houses. Um, the week after that, probably, as I say, I finished my, my re-listen through um, A Storm of Swords, and um, I'll probably try and get Aziz from History of Westeros, who, when I was doing my reviews of the first two books in the series, uh, had him on for the live stream, and I know a lot of people really appreciated that, just chatting through not just what happens in book three, but also the kind of the themes, the character arcs that we've got going on, uh, and just trying to break uh, break that down. It's always good to have a slightly different voice. You get different perspective on things, not just what I'm thinking, but what others um, think. And Aziz has been in the fandom for a very long time, and so he also will be able to bring voices, voices from even wider. So uh, that's probably going to be in a couple of weeks' time. Then we'll finish off the, the North... Um, then we're getting to Christmas. Anyway, on the main channel, we've got uh, lots of videos coming up. We, as I say, we've got the Rob's Will. Um, that one is going to be coming up. And also uh, a video that I wrote very quickly, but people have asked this quite a few times, so I thought I'll just do a video on it. Um, does Stannis actually believe in the Red God? Does he believe that he is Azora High reborn come again? Or is he just is he just using this as a front um I, i've i think there's a clear answer on this one uh, so i put that one uh, in the video so that's that video is going to come in a, a week or two's time but um okay this is uh rounding off for this time we'll be back same time next week looking at house stark uh, so thanks everyone. Thank you moderators. You did a fantastic job as always. Um, uh, if you are watching this back a bit later, somewhere around here will be appearing a link to more live streams. If you'd like to watch some of them and appearing somewhere around here is a link to uh, my Patreon page, which is the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. Um, that's all for this time. Take care everyone. I will see you again soon.